Okay, today we're going to um, look at the first part of the biology chapter. And so just to give you an overview of this, in chapter two we'll start with the discussion of the neuron or the nerve cell that makes up your brain, spinal cord, and all of the peripheral nerves in your body. We'll talk about some neurotransmitters or uh, chemicals in the nervous system that control everything from conscious thought to voluntary movement. We'll cover the brain by talking about the older parts of the brain that evolved first and control more primitive function. And then we'll move to a discussion of the new brain that's more recently evolved that controls more higher functions, such as intellectual control. Lateralization is covered in your module, as is behavioral genetics, so be sure to look over those topics in your module. First of all, the neuron is, of course, the nerve cell that makes up all of your uh, peripheral nerves, the nerves that come out from your spinal cord and the brain and the spinal cord as well. And if you look at the photograph of the neuron, it almost looks as if they're tangled, as if they touch, which we believed at first, that they were kind of woven into a web. As our ability to focus on the neurons became better, we learned that there's actually a gap between many of the neurons' connections. And that gap becomes important in understanding how neurons communicate. So let's start with basic structure. The dendrite receives information from other neurons. So this is a part of the neuron that receives information. The cell body or cell soma with the nucleus at the center is, uh, serves the same function as uh, any cell body, which means it's the center of metabolism and nutrition. The axon moves impulses away from the cell body. The myelin sheath is a protective covering and it's kind of a fatty substance that covers the axons and it actually increases the efficiency of the passage of information down the axon. The terminal branches of the axon, as you can see in this diagram, are at the terminal or the end of the axon and these contain uh, information, chemical information, that's released into that gap between neurons that I mentioned earlier. The synapse is the cleft or the space along with the axon of one neuron and the dendrite of another. Sometimes for simplicity we refer to synaptic cleft and that's just the gap or space between neurons. Just to mention to the neuron support system, glial cells provide support and nutrition to neurons. We're starting to understand that they may provide more than this, but they do provide these two important functions. In the diagram, there's a yellow neuron, and what you see in the yellow neuron are branches at either end of this uh, cellular structure, but you'll also see glial cells that are attached to the neuron that again provide this support and nutrition. Within the nerve cell passage of information is uh, electrical, but between cells it's chemical. And these chemical messengers are called neurotransmitters. They're contained in synaptic vesicles. And on this page I just have kind of a simulation of what vesicles might look like. These are two ends of axons and they're releasing these little bubbles of chemicals in the space between the neurons or the synapse. Some types of neurotransmitters that are important to know for the exam, and we'll talk about these in detail in turn, acetylcholine, serotonin, endorphins, and dopamine. So just to start with acetylcholine, we know that acetylcholine, acetylcholine has a number of important functions that are relatively independent of one, to one another, much like many neurotransmitters. So acetylcholine controls uh, voluntary muscle movement, facilitates memory, and those are just two of the very important functions of this neurotransmitter. Serotonin governs moods and sleep as well. So, for example, we know serotonin is uh, low for many depressed people, and antidepressants help raise serotonin. Unfortunately, a side effect can be drowsiness or sleep issues, and that raises an issue that's important in understanding neurotransmitters when we manipulate the level of these uh, through artificial means, through drugs, 
um, you're not just going to manipulate or change the targeted function or behavior. Likely you're going to influence other behaviors or functions as well. Endorphins are important when you're experiencing pain. They're actually called endogenous morphines or endogenous opiates. And endogenous just means born within. So these are morphine-like substances that our brain naturally produces when we experience pain. For instance, if you've ever had a bad accident, you've broken a limb or you've sprained an ankle, it may not hurt quite as much as you expect it to in the beginning. And part of that is because your body... Uh, releases endorphins which block some of the pain receptors um, which makes a lot of sense from an adaptive standpoint in early evolution it would make sense to have an internal system that helped us block pain from injury so we could get to a safe place now of course these don't continue to block pain because pain actually carries information for instance if you broke your ankle the endorphins would be released temporarily, maybe help you get, um, get into a safer situation so that you could take care of your injury. But you also want the information uh, that's given to you by the pain. It tells you to stay off the ankle so you don't uh, injure it further. They do function like morphine, and chemically endorphins actually resemble morphine. A famous researcher named Hans Kosterlitz actually found that the receptors for endorphins are almost identical to those for morphine, which tells us two things. One is it explains why morphine is so effective in pain relief since it's chemically so similar to our natural pain reliever. And second, it tells us why so many morphine-like drugs are so highly addictive. We have kind of ready-made receptor sites for these substances. If you want to learn more about Kosterlitz's work on endorphins, you can copy and paste the link below and put it in your browser, and I'll give you some more information on his work. The last neurotransmitter is dopamine, and early researchers in the 50s and 60s found out that dopamine was very closely associated with pleasure circuits. The early research was done on rats, and we found that rats who had an electrode implanted in their brain in circuits that were rich in dopamine so they could stimulate and release dopamine would stimulate that area of their brain to exhaustion. They would not stop and they would not satiate or become satisfied um, and stop stimulating. So we knew that this was a very powerful pleasure center in the brain and it turns out that humans of course have similar circuits and so at one time um, stimulation to dopamine rich areas was used for depression but of course we learned that was kind of overwhelming to the patient. It is not used anymore. These circuits are closely associated with pleasure uh, when they're stimulated in a natural way, they bring pleasure in ways that tend to keep us alive and perpetuate the species. For instance, if you're very thirsty and you take a drink of cold water, you'll uh, release some dopamine. It's kind of like your brain rewarding you for doing such something that's good for your body. Now, like most neurotransmitters, dopamine is both excitatory, for instance, it causes symptoms of schizophrenia, and it's inhibitory, for instance, it inhibits muscular tremors. And so anytime that you try to treat, for instance, schizophrenia by lowering dopamine, you might get side effects like muscular tremors. And most psychiatrists and physicians are very, very well versed in these neurotransmitters and the use of drugs to shift the levels of neurotransmitters. So they work with patients to try to maximize benefits and minimize side effects. Now, Olds found, again, that these rats in early research would press levers to provide stimulation to the dopamine circuit and do so to exhaustion. So again, to summarize the importance of dopamine, it's extremely important in pleasure, it's important in inhibition of tremors, and production of schizophrenia. If you're interested in seeing more about early work on dopamine, you can copy and paste the link that's shown in this particular PowerPoint slide.
Hope you enjoyed this discussion, and next time we'll turn to a discussion of brain structure and function.